Process. Thanks for your patience. Welcome to all male panel here. All the female panelists are online, which is a coincidence. Um, this is the first session of all, there are four side sessions which are running simultaneously as of now. This session is on ta data, tax policy making and SDGs. We all know that uh, there are many intersections of data and tax policy making both in terms of the impact data has and tax, tax policy making, but also uh, on evaluating the impact of different tax policies. We have a very fascinating panel, so I'll not take much time from my side. We have Professor Randall here, we have uh, Mario Mansoor, and we will come to them as we uh, go to the different panelists. And we have Ma Professor Mazhar also uh, here. We have uh, Iram who is joining uh, from Oxford and Baba Tunde and Natalia who are from UNDP. I'm not giving their full introductions because we are either way short on time and as we go through the different panelists, we will uh, hear their more introductions. Uh, as of now, I will directly go to Iram because Iram has to leave for her class, unfortunately, and go for, you know, uh, to take a lecture at Oxford. Iram, uh, we wanted to know from you, uh, what is the role of data for tax policy making specifically for research purposes? And in your experience, what are the challenges that you have faced? Over to you. Thank you very much. I'd like to start with an introduction from the UK. If you can see my slides, I'll just crack on and you know go go quite fast, but I'll be happy to follow up with anyone who's um, interested in these questions. So today, just on today's sort of radio, uh, in the program that is most heavily followed in the UK on BBC, we had this quote, data are like the radar technology. When it was invented in the 1930s, it was more powerful than any anti-aircraft missile because you could see what is coming at you. And statistics, good data are like radar. They allow you to prioritize your efforts and to answer important questions. And, and the uh, quote finished by you know, saying, get people together and decide to spend more money on data. This is Tim Harford's words. And uh, some of you will recognize his name. He's the author of Undercover Economist covering issues and this quote was just this morning. So these questions and the need for data emerge in both developed and developing country contexts. And it's so important to get data and just make that investment to get more data because it allows us to answer fundamental questions on policy. I'll go to sort of tax policy. And I, here I'm going to um, use both the terms, you know, research and evidence base for policy together because if we have more research, we're gonna be able to guide policy better. In tax policy, we ask questions like, you know, just simple questions like how much revenue is raised from each tax? Sounds like a simple question, but without data, we can't answer this. What are behavioral responses of taxpayers to changes in incentives? This is a more complicated question than the first one. It's already hard to answer even with good data, but it is crucial to have data to both assess the behavior of taxpayers and to know the tax take of the government. And then questions about the real burden of different taxes, foregone tax revenue from tax avoidance and evasion. And in the developing country context, especially, what we worry about is whether improvements in tax administration capacity lead to any changes in points A to D that I've just um, noted earlier. So. All these questions are relevant for the developing country context and actually even more so. And then we take away um, the tax administration capacity from it. And we really have to focus on answering these questions. And without data, we're basically like without our radar. There are questions about trade, investment, productivity, potential for growth, and a heap of um, different dimensions that we need to worry about in achieving our sustainable development goals. Now, data can be survey-based or administrative. So tax returns is mostly administrative, but we work with all these different types of data sets. So macro level data guides us in giving us broad um, trajectories in you know, investment, in tax collection, in um, capacity behavioral changes, but of course, without going to the micro level in data, as researchers, 
we cannot see these intricacies in terms of behavioral responses to tax policy. And in fact, without having the micro level data, we cannot publish uh, reliable macro level data either. I'm racing through, but also happy to pick these up um, afterwards offline with anyone who's interested. And the main challenges in, in using data for both research and for evidence base and policy relate to institutional buy-in and the trade-off with data security. So tax authority will need capacity or support from institutions like the UN um, to digitize the data, create a safe environment uh, for researchers and policy to use the data, maintain and improve existing data sets. And this is a challenge that we face on a day-to-day -day basis in you know, advanced economies as well. Protect the data and provide training for data safety and use for researchers. A big challenge comes from whether political leaders um, buy you know, this, the importance of evidence base and whether the incentives of the tax administration and the political leadership align. A political cycles may exacerbate issues related to the tension between the objectives of the tax administration and um, the political leaders. And of course, research and policy timelines vary. But in the next few minutes, I would like to just draw up uh, a picture of what a collaborative um, motive looks like or a co collaborative model could look like. So all this slide says is that, well, these are long-term investments. And once these investments are made to solve these problems, we actually have a resilient system which allows us to use research for evidence-based policymaking. Right, um, researchers need reliable and continued access, something that, we can, something that we can pick up. There are ways the UK does this. And you know, I was, uh, I was hoping to give some examples from my own experience with um, UK administrative and survey data. So again, the links will be available for those that are interested through the slide deck. Um, and, and what I would like to kind of conclude with is that the ideal model is a collaborative one. The researcher, will address questions, but they can't answer the important policy questions without having access to the data. While that data access is facilitated by the policy institution, also the data provider, but the model can go either via remote access or if the uh, tax authority or the relevant institution would like on-site access to uh, support data security, then there are different ways and models of doing it. Again, exemplified in the uh, previous slide. The researcher gets the data, works on it, um, and then generates some research output. That might take a while and a longer while than the institution might be interested in. But what the institution can do is to say, well, researcher, this is all good and you've published your papers or you're on your path to publishing the papers, but we'd like to work together. We'd like a policy brief, your initial findings, and then we'd like to work with you to guide our policy processes. So um, again, you know, we just need data. And if developed countries have it, it's not giving us all the answers that we need in a developing country context because a lot of the parameters and the structure of the economy and the objectives of policy may be different in a developing country context. So we would like to get um, access to developing country data as well in a reliable and similar manner. In the end, it is a win-win policy to make data available for research and evidence-based policymaking. And we can only advance in our, you know, by measuring the effectiveness of policies and reforms in achieving our policy goals, namely the sustainable development goals. Let's use our data, our powerful radar, to determine our policy priorities. Thank you very much for your attention. And I apologize I have to leave, but it's been a pleasure to share these thoughts with you. Thanks so much, Iram. That was Iram uh, Gucheri, Professor, Associate Professor at the University of Oxford. Uh, now we will go to Mario Mansoor. Mario is the uh, Division Chief, Tax Policy Division, Fiscal Affairs Department at IMF. Uh, Mario, I will pass you the mic. But before that, Iram reference things related to micro data and macro data and the impact 
cost of having asymmetric data, let's say developed countries are providing that data to the researchers and developing countries are not, uh, uh, that sort of access is not available to researchers. The impact it can have actually, because then contextualization may not happen. So uh, I will go to you uh, in your experience at IMF, you have been working on a long time. What uh, the challenges of lack of data can mean from a multilateral perspective? for tax policy making and what can be a way forward ahead in examples that would have have happened in your uh, work uh, over to you thank you um well first thank you very much for the organizers for this uh, invitation to come and spend some time with you um, on these um, very important and broad issue in tax policy the program you put together is really impressive um I think the three points I would make uh, on your question, actually this was part of my slides, so this will shrink the slides, which is good. Um, first is um, the, um, the dilemma or the um, single most surprising things in our line of work at the IMF um, with countries is that data is available, it's there. It's just not being used, not being put in a format that is um, uh, proper for researchers to use, but most importantly, for policymakers uh, to uh, drive um, database decision making. Um, and and that's this is a bit of investment in infrastructure to do, but mostly in human resources and educating policymakers on the importance of data driven decision making. Um, and so that's an institutional issue, not so much really a big, uh, 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 how should I say that, uh, uh, financial issue in terms of investment, particularly nowadays uh, with the um, availability of technologies. And I'll give a few examples uh, of work we do with countries to show how this can be done. Um, um, your other part of the question was, sorry, can you repeat the... Um, Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so on, on the microdata, um, well, I mean, Iran mentioned that, and this is a key point I'd make, that um, without microdata today, our job is very, very difficult uh, because tax policy, uh, particularly in the past decade, has moved from very much an issue of revenue generating to um, you know, incentives and behavioral um, uh, implications of tax policy are nowadays as important, if not more important, than the money itself. Um, in some cases, um, climate is one issue. In the plenary session this morning, um, the um, the participants spoke about health taxes. Um, uh, so that that's very um, uh, very important to to emphasize that without microdata. Um, uh, we cannot do uh, proper work in our in our line uh, line of business, and how the asymmetry. I think, uh, well, I think one there is a bit of capacity issue, but in in my view, it's not a very important one. Um, the other one is an institutional one. Uh, so we already mentioned uh, a collaborative approach that's very nice in um, a scenario of mature institutions where accountability and resources are available for institutions to collaborate. Um, it is not um, okay in the context of most developing countries because they don't have the resources and they don't have the accountability framework to collaborate. And this lack of collaboration is usually driven by, you know, a very fragmented way of using microdata for uh, decision-making. So institutional issues are really, in my view, at the heart of those asymmetries you're, you're mentioning. Thanks, uh, Mario. Uh, we'll come back to the later presentation also that you have on, uh, on this. I thought probably as Iram was leaving, it will be important to reflect on this question. Uh, and as you said, sort of you know, data is available. It's more a question of mindsets, changing mindsets. 
Uh, UNDP has been working for a long time on uh, sustainable developmental goals. And um, the whole question on measurement of SDGs relate to uh, the availability of data and the access of data. Uh, we have with us today, Baba Tunde, he's the global policy advisor at uh, UNDP. He will be making remarks on how the UN system looks at data in a broader context, not just in context of tax policy making, but also in the context of uh, SDG measurement and uh, looking at the achievements of the different SDGs. Uh, over to you, Baba Tunde. Uh, thanks, and sorry, I cannot see the room, but it's uh, good to see everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, so, yes, and this is uh, this is interesting to hear uh, the, the two presentations earlier. Uh, so, just thinking through this, and uh, in in terms of SDGs and data, right? Uh, it's, yes, we know there's a lot of data that is available, right? Uh, we know that there's uh, different information uh, across uh, globally right, from, by governments, right? Uh, but the question always is, is that data properly structured in a way that it can be used? And I think we saw that from Irem's uh, presentation also earlier. And uh, part of the work that uh, UNDP and the rest of the UN uh, does in this area is to work with government to be able to gather some of this data. Right? Um, so uh, we have... Uh, institutions uh, that have responsibility for different types of data set and that's what you see from the UN stats for instance uh, that are related to the SDGs but then the, the other part of that is how do you work with governments to be able to start to start to generate that data and structure it effectively so from UNDP's perspective, uh, we look at that in three different ways right um, one is the baseline right so the aspect of data intelligence and that's uh, where you know, for us it's important for to work with governments to put in place structures and information that helps to be able to look at data in an integrated way right so well, let's start to see data and you know taxes data on poverty data on development and working with the government to be able to bring those information together and you know in many developed countries it's easy to be able to have a system that's able to house those data, but in many developing countries, that data sits in silos, right? So we've been, you know, through our different work that we do, we work with governments really to help support uh, this kind of a system. Then the, uh, once you have that foundation and baseline in place, now it's now a question of what do you do with that, right? So uh, it's a question of, okay, if I have all this data, what kind of decisions can I start to make with this data? Right? And there's the part of, okay, with, uh, if I see uh, tax revenue data and I see GDP data, uh, what percentage of the tax revenue, for instance, we need to have in order to, to uh, invest in development that we need to make? So that's where the decision intelligence comes and that's where you know the work that we do on the data features platform for instance and providing the codes for governments which start to do see some correlation and start to do some analysis at a global or national level uh, to start to understand that pattern right and uh, make decisions that is for us economists and statisticians and the rest just simple things but it's very very useful uh, for a decision maker to, to see and then on that, then now on top of that is different questions related to you know, development challenges. And uh, I think Iram mentioned some of it earlier in terms of research questions, right? So uh, what if I do this? What if I change this tax policy? And what if I put in place the system? What if I reform phosphorus first subsidies, for instance, right? Uh, what's the implication for that for different aspects of development in the country? And that's where a lot of the work that we do to support the government and you know, modeling aspect and supporting the Ministry of Finance, supporting the National Planning Commission, uh, to start to look at different pathways. And that question intelligence aspect of it sometimes is, uh, you know, it takes a lot of more work. There's, it takes more time to be able to put in place, and there's rigorous research that needs to happen, and that's where the partnership with governments is critical. Right, so that's that's where UN, the work of the UN and UNDP comes in play of 
longer you know partnership on helping government ask, answer some of those questions um, so in different countries and the work that uh, that we do in the SDG finance and tax without borders and the rest uh, is working with governments in those areas of capacity building you know supporting them on modeling you know convening people to be to understand you know in in many cases, we assume that the questions are there already, right? But it's there's a long process of also figuring out what the questions are. You know, what's the right question to ask, given the context, given the uncertainty that exists uh, globally? So that's a, a brief summary of some of the work that we're doing. So it's the you know, supporting government on the basics, on the foundation of putting data together, um, and the, the infrastructure to be able to do that effectively, you know, and translating that to making basic decisions and understanding that data uh, to for decision making at the national level and then making that data available uh, it's for rigorous research and questions that can help uh, answer many of those questions and uh, we do this uh, in different countries in UNDP because we we have uh, presence in many countries and uh, a lot of the work uh, that we do is uh, helps to be able to uh, make that data available so I have a, so I also have a presentation, but I'm not going to cover that now. But it's uh, just to put that uh, out there for now, and then uh, hopefully uh, we can continue to have a dialogue around this and how we support government uh, effectively. Thanks. Thank you, Baba Tunde. Uh, we have given the um, the time we have lost. We have squeezed some of the presentations. Uh, that was Baba Tunde. He's the global policy advisor at UNDP and working on different SDG issues. Uh, I want to come to Professor uh, Mazhar, uh, and uh, he's an economist also working with UNU Wider. UNU Wider has been dealing with these questions on data and data labs uh, in terms of the work that they do for simulation, but also for the research purposes they are working with the developing countries. Uh, Mazhar, we wanted to know, because UNU Wider and in your research you have been dealing with many developing countries, what are the challenges that they face and how in the work, in your work you have worked around this uh, so in as part of your opening remarks if you can also reflect on these questions you mind is if if i answer to this question following my presentation so that will be easier sure. yeah i don't like talking while i'm sitting so no, i think you won't mind if i stand up not at all yeah okay so And if I sit here, I can follow my slides. Yeah, okay, so thanks a lot, Etesham and Yunu Wider for inviting me to this panel. So this, this is a word that you will hear a lot in the next three days, evidence-based policy making. So everyone agrees that we should have like evidence policy based policy. And the way, it, so the way it works, it's like a cyclical process. So where you have data, some source of variation and using that data and variation, you generate some evidence you change policy based on that evidence and then the change in policy against create a variation which you combine with data to like generate additional evidence whether the policy was successful or not so this is the like in continuum this process continues but in practice so developing and emerging countries with the face is there are issues there are problems in every step of this this process so the data could be fault. So data could be faulty. So let's start with an example where data could be faulty. So you know VAT. VAT is a transaction-based tax. And in VAT, every transaction is reported at two points. So once 
as sales by seller and the second time as purchase by purchasers. So in an ideal world, so the sales reported by seller should match the sales reported by the buyers. So one policy, a lot of developing countries are implementing, so they do this matching. So they do this cross matching and they have integrated this cross matching into their business processes in the sense that they're audit and refund mechanism. So they, this data is input, input into this purpose. So this is an African country. I'm not going to tell you the name. So, so I said ideally, so this, 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 this sales and purchase transactions should match, but unfortunately 78% of the time, so the sales reported by the seller is not matched by the purchases reported by the purchaser. So if you are in this world, if so it could be a data entry fold, it could be like a business process error, but if you are in this world and you have integrated this data process into your business process, so then you will be like generating a lot of work for you, for your revenue authority. You will be wasting precious resources in correcting the errors which, which, which the faulty data is, is generating. So faulty data, data will put you like into a, a, a very long and winding path. So we, at the end of which nothing will come. So the data integrated data accuracy is important. So this is another example from another developing country. So you, you know farms, so corporate farms, they are registered with corporate law authorities. So that's a register there. So they are also registered with, with revenue authority. So that's a tax register. So then temptation is for the revenue authority to take data from this corporate registry and say the firms which are not registered, they should have been registered and expand the tax base using that data. So this is one use of like big data. So this is what they did. These like peaks are when they use the data, corporate registry data to register new firms in, in, into the tax, corporate firms. And what, what, what they found out was that a lot of firms, they registered date, they registered a firm, but they never start a business. So then they, they imposed compliance cost on 300,000 corporate firms. They forcibly registered them. But at the end of it, only 3.2% of these were like paying tax in one year after the registration. And the revenue authority increased like their, their job by a lot by having to process these additional 300,000 returns and chasing these 300,000 taxpayers. So all these examples are examples, real world examples where either data was faulty or data, data speaks a language. And if you do not understand that language, so then you are going to interpret the data wrong. And the policy that you based on, on, on that data is going to like put you into, as I said, into a long and unproductive path. So this is another developing country. So this is income distribution of their like biz, uh, sole business taxpayers. So it's a very stable income distribution from 2006 to 2008. And you can see most of the taxpayers. So they are between 100 and 300. So can you imagine? So this is from 2006 to 2008. So can you imagine what they did in 2009? Any idea? So they moved the exemption threshold from 100K to 300K. So essentially they elim eliminated income tax in the country by exempting all farms. So to me, this is another example that either people are not looking at the data or they're not understanding the language that the data is speaking, okay? So another example. So this is like from another developing country. So this is like, partnership earnings distribution. So the country has like a very healthy like number of partnership firms, but in one year they decided that they are under tax. So on average, they were paying 5% of their income as tax. So decided this low, so that they increased it to 25% flat, five times increase in a year. And can you imagine what happened? So 66% of these part year. So again, this is an example. So where you cannot, where you are not using the data or you're not interpreting it right. So this is the final example. So, so, so you know the tax systems, the income tax schedules, so sometimes they're based on notches. 
Sometimes they are based on kinks. So this is a schedule based on notches. So notches are where the average, your average tax rate changes. And because this, they, they, they are very distortionary tax schedule. So there was a research and recommendation was replace these notches with kinks. And the revenue authority was good. So they, they, they listened to researchers. So they replaced kinks with notches with kinks. And what, what, what they, so when they were uh, writing this reform, so they did not consult the researchers. And as a result of that, although they were like, they had good intentions and implemented it. So the tax rate, they reduced by a lot because when you, when a kind based schedule, so you do not tax in from marginal units. So you have to have higher tax rate if you want to raise the same amount of revenue. Again, so this was like, there was no coordination between researchers and the policy makers, how to like fine tune a policy based on, 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 on the evidence. So this, these are the challenges, my sense is which uni data, uni, uni wider's data lab are fulfilling. So they are creating like these five things. So first of all, they are ensuring that data of the revenue authority is safe and secure. So whenever we talk about like partnership between researchers and revenue authority, the anxiety, the anxiousness, the insecurity from the revenue authority's point of view is that this data is like private, this has confidential information, we cannot share it. So you know why it's like first contribution is they are ensuring the security and secrecy of that data. So they completely anonymize this in their data lab so that no private information goes to the researcher. Second thing is that they are creating a platform for sharing data. So once they create these data lab where the data is completely secure and anonymized, so then they will bring in the right kind of researchers who can read and interpret their data and basically generate the evidence which could feed into like the policy making. So second is they are creating these interface between researchers and policy makers, which we like direly need as because of all these examples I, I have seen, and then they are creating a forum where these results can be disseminated to all the revenue authorities and policy relevant people so that they can understand. So because the, the, the problems are common and so are the solutions. So in one country's uh, research, so that, that can eliminate, that can be like helpful for you if you're facing very similar problem. I, I will stop here and I will like wait for your questions at the end. Uh, thank you, Mazar. That was fascinating on the work you and you wider is doing uh, in terms of uh, redacting uh, private information from public uh, from data as well as sort of randomization and making that linkage. I will come back to you later once we go through the opening remarks. Uh, and you referenced to some of the concerns that developing countries also have. Uh, we have with us Professor Rander Karelson. He's the Dean of Johannesburg Business School. Uh, Professor, we wanted to know from you in your initial thoughts uh, along with your presentation on what are the concerns of the developing countries vis-a-vis -vis tax data and how can they be addressed? Professor, over to you. Thanks a lot. And also I want to share my appreciation for being invited to this conference. I think it's extremely useful. Um, I will speak from my personal background. I've been with the South African Revenue Authority for 12 years as the head of research, and I've recently joined the Johannesburg Business School, where I specialize in artificial intelligence and complexity theory. And uh, I'm trying to bring those two uh, concepts together. Hopefully, I will be successful in this in the short space of time that I have. I, I have prepared quite an extensive presentation, so I will skip through most of the slides, but they will be made available for anybody that wants to, to dig into that. I picked up a very interesting notion this morning, that notion of uh, global public good. Uh, and it sort of summarized what I'm trying to get across. Because as we see the intensity and the frequency um, and the interconnectedness of global crises starting to take hold, um, we, I am, from my background, seeing a very complex adaptive global, global system trying to respond to uh, inequalities that forever seem to be uh, planned for, to last for, into perpetuity. 
and uh, no systems theorists will uh, any system theorists will tell you that that's impossible to maintain and sustain and so we have to think a lot different about the world going forward um so global events at the moment are uh or global crises i should say um are up limiting domestic resource mobilization and the state capacity of especially developing countries and their ability to respond to uh, sustainable development goals. And as we heard this morning, no single country or even philanthropic organization can respond alone to what's happening in the world. On top of all of this divides that we are faced with, that's well known, which I'm not going to go into, we are now on top of that, we have a digital divide that has the further potential either to bring the world together or further polarize this, this world, uh, leading to even more fractiousness. Uh, I've read this morning, I read in uh, Financial Times that a bunch of techno billionaires are getting together and decide they are debating whether Alaska or, or, or New Zealand would be the safest place to go to, given the state of the world. Um, but I would venture to say that this actually is presenting us with more opportunity than, than threats. The threats are real um, and, and, and perverse incentives are available for people that are uh, well-versed in, in, in artificial intelligence. intelligence. So I'm gonna go rather fast, um, but like I say, most of, this, of all the slides that hopefully will back up some of my arguments are available. I will make, and I, if, if, if I don't get that argument through, the argument that I essentially want to put across is that with relatively low investment, with high and disproportionate returns, um, administrations can actually harness uh, uh, large returns from, from, from sustainable investment in data, in data infrastructure and human capacity that not only provide the revenue, but also build massive and quite strong resilience uh, uh, in administrations. And I'll use the SARS example from where I come from. We have similarly assisted Rwanda with that also. That's also a case study that one could look at. And then I look at some of the structural impediments. And like I said, uh, those are the main messages that I hope to get across. If I don't get that across, um, at least I've, I've done that in the opening remarks. Um, so as much as any other industry, uh, the AI has to put, as well, this is going to disrupt the world going forward. I mean, blockchain technology, can think about how that can either improve or detract from tax administration. The Internet of Things can you can determine country of origin. It's going to be a whole different ball game, deciding on um, country of origin and localization issues. Machine learning, and artificial uh, uh, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Biometrics. India has mapped um, more than two thirds of its population um, biometrically wise. And so they can determine at customs or at any entry point whether that person is uh, desirable to enter the country. And particular interests are the issue of smuggling and how that will impact on, on customs administration. Um, drones are being used to smuggle vast amount of intellectual property goods over, over countries, um, over the borders of countries. They caught, they caught a drone recently from Taiwan uh, flying into China with um, 100,000 Apple phones uh, below the radar. By just way of example, if you look at what is happening in the African continent, many countries are dependent on trade test taxes. And uh, if the borders are going to cease to exist or rather become poor, more, even more porous, you can imagine what that will do to taxes in the Afri on the African continent, well, actually worldwide. And then the issue of 3D printing, virtual augmented reality and mixed reality I can now export my intellectual property without having to export any physical product. And so how do you, how do you tax such a uh, uh, transfer of technology going forward? And, 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 I, and I'm going to say this because countries that are not sophisticated enough to do that are going to continue to suffer from their intellectual property being exported in the manner that I've described. So at SARS, we have gone through a whole journey of, of data analysis. I'm not going to bore you with this. But we are now in the realm of, well, I'm no longer there, so I shouldn't talk about we. Uh, we are now in the realm of prescriptive analytics where we shape behavior to, 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 for people to respond to. Now, as I said earlier, the, with, with relatively low investment, and when I say relatively low, the emphasis on relative, because we spend about a billion rand on our modernization program, 
but returns have been enormous in effectiveness and revenue realization, and, and you can see for yourself. Furthermore, what we see is that this modernized systems, uh, and you know, it, it deals with self-population, uh, auto-population, deals with third-party verification, it deals with e-filing, all those of those things, shows that after every crisis, SARS was able to respond and rebound quite uh, aggressively um, uh, in buoyancy of its tax collections. Um, in, in 2008, we had a dip uh, similar to the rest of the world, but we responded much quicker than the rest of the world in recovering our tax revenues. You can also see that with the pandemic, you can see there was a, a, a decline in um, tax revenue, but it was actually very little in comparison. And the, and the responsiveness and, de, and the re, um, rebound was quite, 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 in, quite interesting and quite fast. Um, what, what data analysis, analytics did for us at SARS is because South Africa comes from a history of severe inequality. Uh, we know of the history of South Africa, um, very rich people and very poor people. But with our data analysis, we could advise our policy administrators to provide tax relief for the lower end in a sustainable way. And this slide actually tells you that we were able to provide disproportionate tax relief to the poorer people, uh, making for a more, I mean, we're far, far away from where we want to be, but providing tax relief to allow more people to move into, into the middle class. Uh, and that brought some form of stability. We're not there where we should be. As I said earlier, we did a lot of Af interventions on the African continent uh, with ATEF. And the point I want to make is that if anybody wants to invest into Africa and they were to ask me for my advice, I would tell them to invest in building capacity in tax administration, because that's uh, the, probably the point of contact where you can make the most difference, uh, as we have seen with our work that we did in Rwanda. We also developed tax statistics. I'm going very fast through this. This is the latest edition. Um, and this enabled us to provide detailed tax statistics to our policymakers uh, because we could track all, all individuals that were employed, that are in employment and that were in employment. We could track cohorts over time. And we found very interesting statistics in there, of course, gender statistics, dem dem demographics. But what we found, other than our statistics agency, is that we found 500,000 more people in employment and in high income employment. And because our tax statistics, sorry, our statistics agency cut off at 65, the age of 65. When we did this analysis, we found a lot more pensioners coming back into the system to support, as we jokingly referred to it, their middle-aged unemployed kids. Um, we could divide detailed analysis by remuneration across age. And more importantly, we have a massive problem with youth unemployment in our country. And we were able to act dynamically track the employment of our youth. And other than them being underemployed, we also find that they're periodically and seasonally employed. And we were able to advise per sector our government how to respond. We were able to drill this down to municipal level, and this allowed for local planning. And we found very interesting and counterintuitive uh, information um, about the wealth distribution across the country. We were able to also use our tax statistics, which is now in its 12th year of publication, to assist uh, with surveys. And I'm not going to go into this detail, it's a busy slide, but very effectively so they were able to focus uh, uh, on, on improving their surveys. So what are those structural impediments that prevent the developed world, at least from an African perspective for now, to, uh, to respond effectively to some of these global crises? So first of all, we all know about the extreme inequality in wealth, but interestingly enough, as we have this extreme inequality in wealth, we also see almost a counter cyclical response to population growth. We see this in the next slide that this US China grow older and by the year 2040 or so, uh, about 40% of the US will be over the age of 65 and we're seeing for falling fertility rates uh, in the developed world uh, where the re replacement fertility rate of two is below, is below the replacement fertility rate of two. We see that in Africa and in other parts of the developing world, the only population growth is happening in those areas. And so what is happening in, South, in Africa, the average age is 20 years old, we find 
that that youth dividend either has to be harvested in a way that can sustain this growing aging northern population or uh, it, by, by education uh, or by other, other means. Th these are just some of the global dynamics that I picked up. So as we see, and in fact, this is the almost Africa's constant Sisyphean uh, phenomena that they have to deal with. Developing nations, and especially Africa, are disproportionately affected by global crisis. Uh, one example is the pandemic has caused Africa debt to spiral from 30% to 60%, uh, roughly 31 to 61% or something like that, wiping out all previous attempts to have debt uh, reduction. Now, what that does, the accompanying debt servicing costs then limit for these countries to effectively respond to SDG. So they're caught in a vice grip. They want to respond, but they can't. Now you can add other uh, phenomena, and I'm rushing in the interest of time. You can add, add other phenomena, the disproportionate illicit flow of funds from the African continent. It's ridiculous, 86.6 billion rand per, per annum. If you add that back, or you pay and find a way to pay it back in, onto the African continent, there's no need for foreign aid, and that even exceeds foreign direct investment. Um, uh, and also global climate change. Uh, I'm really rushing through this. So, um, so there I made the point of the debt, uh, SSA, the South Saharan, South Saharan African debt spiraling from 35%, uh, and especially over the pandemic period to over 60%, completely wiping out the ability to respond to global crisis. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there is a new actor on the stage, which is called the digital actor or the digital divide. Um, so Africa has harnessed some of it and Africa's responded in many cases magnificently employing this. We have drones flying out into desolated places, delivering medical equipment. Um, and also the financial sector has shown some more remarkable examples for the developed world how to deal with the digital, digital uh, advances. But at the end of the day, if this is not replicated across Africa, and if we don't find a way to filter this into our youth dividend, again, Africa is going to stay behind in the digital advancement space. And I've got some statistics here, which, I'm not, which I won't have time to go into. I've mentioned the issue of illicit flow of funds from Africa. Um, so the globe, they, it's not that the globe didn't take note of this, the globe, Global agencies like the World Bank and the IMF have re recognized that you have to put money into the developing countries uh, in a sustainable way to advance the SDGs uh, for a better world and a more equi equitable world. And for that, you need a tax. And somebody this morning mentioned the two-pillar solution. I've got detailed backup slides on this. Uh, so the recommendations from my perspective is we must curtail IFFs from the, from the African continent, especially from the African continent. Um, we must enhance reporting of offshore wealth management uh, or wealth diversion. Um, African countries must strive to, to, to create a more diverse tax base and not be overly dependent on, on single source of revenue or resource-based revenue. Um, but when I speak in my country about how do we address this, I always tell the politicians, if I were the president of South Africa, I'd make data free, I'd make access to data free, and I will allow African creativity to flourish. And all of that, once you've done all of that, then you will have a tax base that can be responsive to the digital divide. I'm sorry if I rushed through this, but I tried to make a lot of points in 15 minutes. Thank you for allowing me. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. That was illuminating, um, covering from data analytics to big data to the work that is happening in South Africa and the relevance for it in South Africa and beyond. Uh, there have been, and as Professor was referencing, uh, data related to gender disaggregated data, need for that for policy making and the impact, uh, the importance of youth dividend and the need for data when making policies. Uh, we have with us uh, Natalia Pushkareva. She's also online. She's joining us today from Samarkand. She's the regional program specialist for UNDP for Eastern Europe and Central Asia. 
Natalia, I wanted to go to you to know more if you have any case studies of uh, the importance of data for uh, sustainable development and SDG policy making. Over to you, Natalia. Um, hello, everyone, uh, from surprisingly rainy and cold summer Kant. Uh, yes, of course, I will be very pleased to share a couple of case studies with you briefly about why um, data is so important for informing development-oriented tax policies. Uh, so excuse me, my presentation was supposed to be rather introductory at least, but um, uh, at first, but uh, I will adjust it. So um, I think for a long time, we mostly, and when I say uh, we, we, I mean poly the tax policy community, we mostly rely on common sense and uh, yeah, what feels right, what we thought was right when making tax policy choices, and we made them rather intuitively without much reliance on data, um, in big part, of course, uh, because um, lots of data was just not available, uh, unlike now. And that led to some interesting consequences. Apparently, even now when data on many things is available and we have access to all this expertise and all the data and knowledge, sometimes we still do not quite get it right. For example, um, my, one of my favorite cases, uh, which is like the first day uh, case on tax I tell every, anybody, would be on taxation of uh, female hygiene products in uh, the UK and Scotland. So um, they were really concerned about period poverty, which is still an issue even in developed countries like the United Kingdom. And so they decided that no woman should be going through this and they want to make uh, female hygiene products more available to consumers. And so they um, decided to not apply VAT to these products and uh, like tax it at zero rate or something. So uh, uh, meaning that that will make them more uh, affordable to uh, final consumers, to women who need these products. Uh, but apparently it doesn't quite work like this because I, uh, they kind of forgot who actually make this decision about the price that is charged. And uh, those are corporations that are actually producing this product. So these corporations simply do not um, convey this exemption uh, from VET to customers. They do not pass this on to women and they continue to charge exactly the same price. So yes, uh, these products are not uh, VET taxable, but the price didn't really change. And also like, why would they? Because uh, producers uh, based on their corporate interests, they understand that if women are buying them, uh, buying such products at this price, they will continue to do so, right? So they, they had really little stimulus to uh, change the pricing. And so eventually the reform that was supposed to benefit most vulnerable women in the society actually benefited huge corporations, which was not the intention uh, of the legislator at all. So there are many cases like this one where you, even if you really have best interests of vulnerable groups at your heart and you really mean well, if you don't quite think it through, if you don't, if you miss some important steps in um, how tax policy works, um, about which data can tell you a lot, you can just uh, get it wrong and uh, yeah, uh, cause some really uh, unforeseen consequences, which are very different from what you intended to. And the second case uh, that I have here, which is also about like intuition, uh, is for example, um, a re uh, in a small country in Europe, I think several years ago, uh, they tried to tax boats more because boat is a boat is like a luxury item uh so by taxing boats um uh, uh, higher you kind of uh get to really reach people right so you're not taxing the people who really are making it from uh, one salary to another you are really taxing the rich so they thought that it was so clear so clever uh and an excellent instrument to make sure that you target the right uh, tax pay is that you actually want to pay more. But what they forgot about is that 
boats are actually very movable and it's actually very easy to just move it to a neighboring country uh, overnight and uh, just keep it there and just stop paying taxes in your jurisdiction, which is exactly what happened. Uh, and so, so many people made this decision and just uh, yeah, uh, moved their boats uh, somewhere else where the tax was the same or even lower. Uh, so yeah, exact, uh, exactly the same. Um, the legislator had good ideas at heart. They wanted to tax the rich more heavier, but they didn't quite think through about how the uh, tax will work. Um, yeah, I think I had a couple of other cases as well, uh, but I think I uh, might be really running out of time. And we actually uh, wanted to um, give a chance uh, to people to talk to each other, to ask questions so for our panelists, um, which joined the session. And yeah, uh, developing countries are facing many, many challenges. And as we saw today, when uh, collecting, storing, processing, analyzing data that is relevant uh, for tax policy making. And um, there is still a lot of work to do in that dimension. But as we have a very strong country presence, that gives us hope that if we target our assistance really wisely, we can actually create a positive impact in many countries where we operate. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I will return floor to Akhtisham and uh, yeah, maybe uh, you prepare some uh, interesting questions for us and our panelists. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Natalia. Thanks for uh, reflecting on the importance of evaluation of tax policies also. We have six minutes only because some of the panelists have also to leave at one sharp. Uh, so we'll open the floor right away. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please uh, raise your hand and you can also introduce yourself. I think there are some questions online also, but before that, uh, in the room. I don't mind going second if somebody else has a question. Or should I just, okay. So I had three quick questions. One was for Babatunde. Is there a data source by UNDP which provides SGG finance requirements at a national level? Because so far we get aggregate figures like developing countries need 2.5 trillion, but at a national level, is there such a data source that would be helpful? The uh, second question is for uh, Mr. Randall and congratulations on your excellent presentation. The Thabo Mbeki report on illicit financial flows from Africa had recommended that the uh, customs, uh, sorry, the uh, company registrations office and tax authority office databases should be linked. Uh, uh, your experience in South Africa with that recommendation and other African countries, if you could share and how that has affected data tax collection. And the third uh, question is for Mr. Mario and maybe even Atisham, if he's up for it, is that uh, one of the big sources of illicit financial flows is uh, transfer mispricing and uh, developing countries really struggle to purchase expensive databases like Orbis and so on through which they can correct transfer mispricing. So is there space for international organizations to provide this data as a public good so that all developing and all countries actually can access uh, this database? Thanks, Abdul. Um, Dimitri Konsevich, um, I work for GIZ, the German Development Corporation. Maybe my qu uh, question is more suitable to uh, Natalia. Um, Often we do know what good tax policy is, um, as for example, um, in the last panel uh, mentioned by Chiara and uh, Cardenas, um, energy subsidies um, do benefit the rich. Um, we do know that. However, how do we get through to um, politicians as researchers and policy advisors? So how to um, get into the room uh, when decisions are being made um, and get through the um, noise um, and um, leave um, in, uh, intuition based uh, policy making behind us? Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for those questions. I think there's a question online also, uh, but you'll have to open your phone. <laughs> Which is for Mario. So, uh, uh. yeah. So I, I will first go to Mario on both the questions that, uh, that Abdul had. Um, 
and also sort of you know connected to what our colleagues from the GIZ mentioned. Uh, many times we know what is the right policy, but how do we build that political capital to bring the politicians and other stakeholders together? And in your experience at the work IMF is doing, if you have been able to do that in a particular case. And the other question is on comparables, uh, which uh, Abdul referred to, which I'm also happy to take over. Um, thank you. Uh, on the mispricing issue and illicit financial flows, I think there's um, there's a bit of a gray line there on what do we mean by illicit financial flows. So in terms of mispricing, um, it is not always straightforward that it's illegal uh, when you're, uh, you know, pricing between related companies, uh, things that do not exist elsewhere. Um, it's, it's a valuation issue before necessarily saying it's illicit financial flows. Uh, you cannot compare those pricing, for example, the way you compare um, illicit flows from drug trafficking, uh, illegal arms trafficking, et cetera. So I think we need to pay a bit of attention to what is really um, illegal, uh, 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 illicit, and what is kind of a borderline. Um, but your point, uh, you have a point in that the difference over the past 10 years from a perception perspective of taxpayers between what we call tax avoidance, which is legal, you avoid according to laws that allows you to do so, and tax evasion, which is illegal, it's a criminal activity in most um, countries, uh, that line today is different from where it was uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, on the, um, uh, we know what's bad and what's good. Um, again, it's not so simple. Um, I don't think it's always straightforward to say what it's bad and what's good. Maybe the tobacco case mentioned this morning is a straightforward one, but the sugar um, uh, one on which actually I've done quite a bit of work um, is not so simple. It's not so straightforward. Um, but. Putting aside this, how do you convince politicians of what is good and what's bad? Um, and I'd like to go back to the purpose of that session, which is, um, you know, um, I think in the panel this morning, um, somebody mentioned um, data as development rather than data for development. What we're trying to do here is not ask countries to give us data to do research only. What we want to do is put the data into the hands of countries to do their own research. And this is what we need to talk about a lot more than just simply data for research. I think the challenge really is putting data, organizing data in the hands of countries to do their own research, to build their own cases for dealing with the political economy of taxation. Um, and one straight answer to your question, maybe not a complete answer, is simply the evidence to politicians. Often, um, what we don't do and what countries also, I think, can do better is what we call ex ante analysis. You know, we put in a place a policy and then afterwards we say it's bad policy rather than actually studying the implication of the policy before putting it in place. And there is a lot of um, such examples, not only in developing countries, to be fair, but also in OECD countries, during the pandemic, bad policies, you know, for example, across the board, VAT cuts, you mentioned 20% of the richest, you know, gain from energy subsidies. Well, that's what across the board tax cuts sometimes do. They are blunt instruments to provide some relief during rising prices, um, but they are not, um, you know, as efficient as some other options. Um, and I don't know really of a case I mean, one, one really good, good case to look at is, uh, for example, the lower VAT um, in the UK during the pandemic. Well, now research has started to say that actually the incidence of this wasn't to the benefit of consumers. It was mostly the restaurants that made more profits from this. And so I think the ex ante analysis, again, data as development rather than data for development, countries need to be able to organize themselves in order to produce those ex ante analysis, meaning what are the possible policy implications beyond just revenue, right? Behavioral, I think Iram gave a nice 
list this morning on the issues that we tried to look at. This is what needs to be done. Thanks, uh, Mario. Uh, I'll go to Professor uh, Randall on the question Abdullah asked on illicit financial flows. Thank you. Um, yes, look, there are many gray areas around um, IFFs, and um, I've attended many con international conferences, OECD, World Bank, and IMF. But first of all, what I've noticed is that uh, the translation of well-intended and well-crafted policies often don't find traction in the developing world, surely because of capacity problems. Um, because the level of participation of the developing countries in these fora are limited because of, of capacity issues and, 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 and basically uh, human capital issues. Um, there are just a few people that go there and, they, and, and they, have to deal, they have to cover many fronts uh, often at this, at this fora. But um, interestingly enough, there are still a number of unexplored uh, gaps that are, that are of a global nature. Um, and one of the things that I worked on was, uh, when I left SARS, it's still not completed, is the issue of trade asymmetry, where what is exported from one country does not match what is imported in another country. And especially in the area of gold, uh, seems to be massive gaps in what is reported there. Um, and, and that says to me that there are still global gaps that can be addressed uh, with the commitment of, of international agencies. Uh, but. I think to get back and to answer the question a straight point, the issue of investing in human capital and data, data structures are so lucrative. By way of example, SARS spent a billion rand on modernizing its systems. We are realizing more than 1.5 trillion rand at the moment. So that is how massive this investment is. If you invest in people and systems that can understand and internalize many of the events that are happening on the, on the international horizon. And that is why South Africa is able to maintain a tax to GDP ratio of close to 25%. Now, I'm not trying to single out South Africa. All I'm trying to point out is to say that without that investment, you will not realize well-intentioned global policy or global interventions. Thanks, Professor Randall. Uh, Natalia, there was a question uh, for you also on uh, how to build that political capital, which Mario uh, deliberated, but I, we also wanted to know your views on that. Over to you. Uh, hello again, everyone. Yes, indeed, I think Mario said pretty much everything. I wanted to say evidence is the key, obviously, but I also wanted to stress um, just raising public awareness about things that we seem uh, as not working the way they're supposed to, as unfair, as unjust. And I think the more we discuss this, the more they, we let governments know that we are not really fine with that. And there is this public demand for changing things. Uh, I think the more likely the change is to come, like with corporate tax avoidance, we've been, we, it, for years, it's been such a theoretical issue, and no one except for tax academics and tax practitioners really was concerned, but then, boom, you know that your grandma is paying more taxes than Starbucks, and it becomes personal, and uh, yeah, it raises emotions in you, and you see this as unjust and unfair, and you take it to the streets and you protest, and then OECD does the BEPS project, um, which definitely contributes to tackling uh, the issue. So I think this is also a big part of um, what we can do to raise awareness, to engage civil society um, and other organizations that are doing relevant work uh, in uh, yeah, uh, uh, lighting up these issues and uh, uh, drawing some attentions uh, some attention to uh, tax policy concerns. Thank you, Akhtisham. Thanks, Natalia. Uh, we are already six minutes uh, over time, um, but I just wanted to check with Mario. It's, it's fine if you can stay for five more minutes because we have a few questions for you online also, and I see some hands in the room still. And yeah, Professor Randall, if it's fine that we can extend it by five to 10 more minutes. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, this is Markus Meinzer, uh, Director at a Tax Justice Network. And um, I find it very interesting, the, the question on how to create a political uh, interest and the dynamic the demand for change and on the ground for the pressure for, for implementing the things that we know are, would work well. 
And I wonder what role does the tax secrecy play here and also the tax secrecy that maybe is Im imposed by the OECD. And maybe that goes back to the question if we have chosen the right forum for tackling the pressing issues in at least the international dimension here, right? The OECD imposed the secrecy on the country by country reporting data, for example, which demonstrably would have had the potential to increase the taxing capacity by lower income countries tremendously. And now those countries are being forced to go through very, very complicated, intricate processes, not with the end result that they are now in a worse place than they've been 10, 10 years ago, relative to the advanced countries. They have solved their information needs. So information is power, secrecy is sort of exclusion of power. And the OECD has played a, a, a very, very harmful role in that in that way that, that they have exacerbated these these um, challenges so I, I I would I would surmise or ask you how, how you think the the tax policy space that we need is actually constrained by by the wrong choice of the forum uh, where we are setting the rules for for those um, for those uh, tax policy design discussions Um, thank you. My name is Marlene Lemhard Parker from Tax Administration, Jamaica. And, um, oh, oh, I'm sorry about that. Marlene Lemhard Parker uh, from Tax Administration, Jamaica. And my question is directed to Professor Carlson. And um, I'm particularly interested in um, their presentation mentioning the youth dividend. And I don't know if uh, in your research, in your deliberations generally, uh, if you get the sense that policymakers are making the link uh, between capitalizing on the youth dividend and the sustainability. Uh, in my own country, uh, um, the impression that I, I don't work in the area of sustainability per se, but I get the sense that uh, they seem to view it as uh, youth unemployment and the spillover effect from that, which is crime. They tend to view it, the issue as being crime. And so the resources are transferred there. Uh, the other issue concerning youth, I think, is that even those who go on to be product productive are employed, they tend not to remain they are recruited elsewhere or they migrate. So there's a brain drain. And so I just wanted to know what interventions have been done in South Africa or from your own research, uh, what are the opportunities you see there for uh, policymakers to turn that around? Thanks, Marlene. Uh, Mario, there is a question for you online also uh, 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 with, uh, on how can developing countries improve the data situation? Uh, one of the options is collaboration, but are there some other opportunities also? Uh, and I know, um, Abdul, there were some questions that were unanswered because Baba Tunde has left on the question of national level as SDG data. I will get back to your question on comparables once we uh, hear back from Mario and Professor Rang. Mario, over to you. Um, I think one issue is nothing prevents country from actually making their own TVC available because the data is, you know, I, I don't know how an international organizations can impose. Uh, you, you need some form of agreement, I guess, across countries to say that everybody would allow this data to be available to the public. Um, but you probably know that in some countries, data on multinationals with some limitations are available to the public. So you can actually access these data online uh, to do, um, you know, research work for. So I think, um, you know, before blaming international organizations, perhaps countries can actually do unilateral actions that would make those data available. 
Um, but I, 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 this is just a thought. I'm, I'm, not, um, uh, I'm not trying to solve the issue that you ask, which I think is, is extremely important. If all these data were available publicly, the transparency of cross-country transactions and valuations uh, would be extremely um, uh, useful for the public debate on uh, you know, the fair uh, sharing of multinational profits across borders, because this is really the fundamental issue, is you know, how is profit taxed in a modern economy, uh, which should be um, fundamentally different from how it was done 100 years ago. On uh, improving collaboration, um, so we do a lot of work on microdata, and I wanted to show you how some countries actually can develop its own capacities, like what South Africa did over the past 15 years, um, um, in, in, a, in a way that would make um, the analytical work really in-house. Um, I think one idea is the following, is um, the one thing that you find in developing countries in the tax policy making area or other policy making areas, and to some extent also in developed countries is what I call fragmentation of the process. So you have customs thinking about customs, you have the tax administrations thinking about domestic VAT and withholding on wages, you have the Ministry of Economy thinking about investment incentives, okay, and very little coordination between these entities. In the Ministry of Finance, the policy making function lacks coordination across those poles. So you need to think about a way to integrate the function in order to you know, create the necessity for integrated data work. That necessity today is not perceived, in my view, correctly by policymakers. Policymakers you know, ask for um, a very fragmented way to conduct policy instead of an integrated way. Um, and so fixing the process itself by creating structures in the Ministry of Finance that deal primarily with tax policy making, like what many advanced economies have, um, South Africa, a few African countries. Uh, now this is a huge trend going on in uh, Central and East, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, for example. I think this is a healthy way of developing data for uh, policy making internally. For us, we can always make it easy. Why? Well, because I have my staff to work the data if I don't like the quality. But that's not the issue. This is the easy way to go about it. The issue is really how you create the incentives domestically, locally, for um, uh, uh, structures to build their own uh, capacities to, to deal with data. Thanks, Mario. Uh, I will quickly go to Professor Randi. Yes, uh, thanks for that. I also wouldn't want, I was tempted not to mention the OECD response, but then on the other hand, what, these are things we need to talk about because on the one hand, you have the G20 that commits itself to transparency and global upliftment, and yet some agencies uh, tend to go uh, the opposite direction. And transparency is key and almost integral to, to the integrity of the entire global tax system. So, so there's some work to be done and perhaps some lobbying. Uh, the issue of youth dividend, um, in South Africa there's a raging debate about that at the moment because we have growing unemployed, uh, growing graduate unemployment. And more and more the question is asked whether our education system are responsive to this new reality of digital transformation. If you look at the World Economic Forum report, uh, 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 more than a billion people will have to be reskilled before, before 2030. So, so yes, it is raging and exactly what you were saying, uh, the focus was probably more on containment of crime rather than looking at the exploitation or the leveraging of the, of the youth dividend. Um, and, uh, but I think people are more and more realizing that the, the African youth is required for the, to counter offset the, the, the growing the aging North, I should say. Um, so um, the other debate that's also raging in South Africa is why are we training pe young people to go and work in other parts of the world? And if you go to any country, basically, in the world, you find South, find South Africans, and some of our best talent is being exported. Uh, so you have to ask the moral question, you know, do you don't, 
are you going to not develop your youth because you're scared they're going to leave you, or are you going to develop enough so that you could actually have a balancing effect? Um, but I mean, there are other obvious uh, benefits of repatriation of, of money and all of those things. But the moral question for me is, is our, our constitution is committed that everybody will be developed to their full potential. And so that is the starting point for me when I have this debate. Yeah. Thank you, Professor uh, Randall. Very quickly to summarize and to conclude, because I don't, we don't want to keep you away from your lunch also. Uh, um, I will reflect more on this question of the role of UN, because the Secretary General in his very recent report to the General Assembly has talked about moving away from the patchwork of agreements and frameworks on tackling illicit financial flows to a more uh, rule-based uh, system. So I'll come back to those questions later in the day. On the questions of comparables also, there are two different questions. One is the availability of uh, uh, that those sort of data at the country level and that access of those comparables to different tax administrations. Uh, and then there are different private players who are working in this in making that data available. There is a good case to be made for this to be a global public good. Um, and as we heard from some of the panelists, uh, it's a journey, like in case of South Africa, uh, it started somewhere and now it has changed. And now there's a more political salience to focus on these issues. So thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, it was very interesting. Thank you so much for your questions. We still have some questions online, but we'll leave it there and uh, will be available to talk uh, during the lunch. So we'll see you all there at the lunch table. Thank you.